Welcome to this crash course on deep learning, part two, convolutional neural networks. So what we're going to do first is we're going to look at convolutions proper, namely channels, pooling, strides, and so on. Then we'll advance to convolutional networks per se, as in Lynette and AlexNet that are very, very similar, even though they are separated by over a decade. And then we'll go and discuss all the innovations that went into modern convolutional neural networks in order to classify images properly. Let's get started. So let's say we want to classify dogs and cats in images. And well, let's say we have a good camera. So for instance, you know, you could use your cell phone and your cell phone has probably, you know, a 12 megapixel camera. So maybe the fancier cell phones have up to 48, 64 megapixel cameras. So this is monstrous. <laughs> and as such, the model size of a given single hidden layer, multi-layer perceptron with maybe a hundred hidden size units might be 3.6 billion parameters. Um, this is a problem because I checked on Wikipedia and last time I checked the population of dogs and cats respectively was in the order of 900 million dogs and 600 million cats. So even if I took a photo of each and every single cat and dog that exists in the world, I would probably not be able to build a really good classifier into cats and dogs. So at the same time, while well, we know that if we open, let's say our iPhone or Google Photos or, you know, uh, use AWS recognition or whatever, it's very easy to have, you know, a cat and dog classifier available. This is very straightforward. So therefore it's very clear that the, the approach that I described doesn't work. Okay, by the way, here's the reasoning in a bit more detail. So if you have, you know, 36 million input dimensions and you have a hundred neurons, then 36 million times a hundred is 3.6 billion. And so that's around 14 gigabytes of memory and most modern GPUs will struggle with that amount of memory required. So, okay, so this clearly does not work. Um, now let's play a game. So you've probably seen this character Waldo and usually what happens is you have a photo and then, you know, you, there's a picture of Waldo somewhere in the photo and the goal is to find Waldo. Um, so this is something that you can use to entertain children for a very long time. And even though Waldo is easily recognizable, you know, with red and white stripes and with glasses, and he looks a little bit nerdy, he's really hard to find. If you've ever played this game, well, it's hard. On the other hand, if we looked on the right, well, Waldo is very easy to find. There are lots of Waldos. As a matter of fact, this is apparently part of the Guinness Book of Records largest number of Waldos in an image attempt. Okay, so what makes this Waldo finding really easy here? Well, because I can just, you know, locally zoom in on, you know, some nice little square area and I can shift this around. And whenever I see a Waldo, then, okay, I can see found one. And so building a Waldo counter this way by just scanning the image would not be hard. The reason why this works is because I have translation invariants. In other words, the Waldo-ness on the lower right should be the same as the Waldo-ness on the upper left. Secondly, the Waldo-ness is something that's fairly local. Mind you, this is also what makes it so difficult to find a Waldo in general in the various Waldo games, because I might be admiring a lot of details in the drawing, but if there's no Waldo, it doesn't tell me where else Waldo might be, except that he's not there. Okay. Now it turns out that if you apply those principles to the formulation in the multilayer perceptron, then you get convolutions. There's more detail to that in the book. 
And I'm going to skip that here, but suffice it to say, if you were an alien and you wanted to do computer vision and you'd never talked to Jan Lecao or anybody else about convnets, you would still come up with convolutional neural networks just by applying math. Okay, that's actually the beauty of it. Anyway, so what's a convolution? Well, a convolution is basically if I multiply one function with another pointwise and I shift this, and then depending on whether I flip one function as I shift it or not, I get a convolution or a cross correlation and autocorrelation. So to make complicated things simple, here's an input, let's say, you know, this three by three matrix, and I convolve it with a two by two kernel. And then what I can get is, and there's a nice animation, you can see how it goes over the image. It and this it basically, you know, goes and grabs, in this case, it's a, you know, a three by three kernel on a four by four image, and you still get, you know, a two by two output. Basically pointwise multiplies and adds the terms. So for the first upper left term, we basically have zero times zero plus one times one, plus two times three plus three times four, and that happens to be 19. And you keep on doing this, right? So that's a 2D convolution. Right. Now, what you basically get is you get the original input minus the convolutional kernel plus one as a dimensionality. So what happens now is therefore, if I have, you know, this megapixel image, and I have maybe a three by three convolution, then I only really need 10 parameters, right? Three by three, so that's nine for the convolutional kernel plus one for the bias. So we, what we've done is we've now gone from, you know, 12 or 36 million parameters respectively to 10. That's pretty awesome. Now, of course, this means that you can do a lot less but here's some examples. So I could take, you know, this beast on the left. I'm not quite sure what it is, but um, I can do edge detection or sharpening or Gaussian blurs with it. And that's just an example of what can be done by a convolution. Okay. Now that gets us very far, but not entirely. I also need to look at padding and stride. So let's say I take a 32 by 32 input image and I apply a five by five convolutional kernel. And so after one convolution, I've gone from 32 by 32 to 28 by 28. And then after seven layers, I'm at four by four and um, that's where things end. So in other words, if I just use convolutions, then there is no way I can, for instance, on MNIST, use deep networks with more than seven convolutional layers. Okay, well, you maybe shouldn't be doing that anyway, but even if you wanted to, you couldn't. And part of the reason is that as you have your convolutional kernel going over your image, well, on the boundaries, you can't move further out. And this is why you end up losing some dimensionality there at every step. So just to get some idea, well, that's what happens. Now, what you can do to fix it is by just padding things with zeros. And as a matter of fact, that's what padding does, nothing else than just adding zeros around. Now, could you do other things than add zeros? Yeah, probably you could, and maybe some of them might give you an epsilon, an improvement, but the key point, the key innovation is that if I take my original data and I pad it appropriately, I'm not going to lose dimensions. So for instance, if I have, you know, a, an image and I have a three by three convolutional kernel, so that means it would eat two pixels on either side, I would need to pixel, 
you know, on, as in top and horizontally and vertically, I would need to pad that image with one pixel all around to retain the same size and shape. Okay. Now, this is good. So now at least we can decouple um, size decreases and convolutions. The other thing that we need to do now is we need to actually go and manually be able to reduce the size. And you get this by using a stride. And a stride is exactly the same thing as what you would use in linear algebra when you deal with matrices. You basically just skip stuff. Because otherwise, if I have a really high dimensional input like 24 by 224, then I need 44 layers to reduce this to a four by four matrix. That's too expensive. So one way of fixing this is by just skipping rows, right? And this is what it does here. So for instance, if I have, you know, a stride of two, it just goes and skips every second row. If I had a stride of three, then it would skip, you know, uh, you know, two out of three and so on. So to recap, padding allows me to retain the dimensions Strides allow me to subsample. Now, there's another thing that we need to deal with, namely multiple input and output channels. So let's look at a picture of this woman there. She's a very famous woman. Uh, her name is Lena, and she is very famous in the image processing community um, because her image, her, or rather her photo, was used for image compression for a long time. Um, so this picture, it's not just the head, but it continues further down and she doesn't wear very much. The point being, this is a, I think a Playboy or Penthouse image. And so this photo is quite famous. She didn't actually know it. And then later on when she found out, I think she was in her forties or fifties. At some point she ended up giving an invited talk at an image processing conference and was very honored to be, well, the guest speaker where in a community where she had gotten famous without actually knowing about it. Anyway, so long story short, this photo is composed of three channels, you know, red, green, and blue. And it's the mix of those three that actually, you know, allows you to obtain, you know, a meaningful image, right? So this is much more meaningful than that one, right? So, now, if you think about it, if you just converted it to grayscale, you would lose a lot of information. So let's actually use, you know, red, green, and blue. For instance, if I want to have a strawberry ripeness detector, then the red channel and the green channel would be pretty significant. So what I can do thus is if I have an input in multiple channels, then, you know, I might just have multiple kernels for a given input and add them together to get a single output. Now I can do this multiple times to get multiple output channels in the same way. So this way I can go from maybe RGB to channels denoting horizontal lines, vertical lines, circles, and other features, right? So each channel may recognize a particular pattern and the input channels, you know, then kernels, they go and combine those patterns. So for instance, if I wanted to get, you know, upper left corners, I need, you know, a horizontal edge and a vertical edge, and they both need to coincide in one place. So this is how you can build higher order features. Now, one very special thing are the so-called one by one convolutional channels. And in this case, all you're doing is you're not really convolving, but you're just looking over all the channels for a given pixel and you multiply them effectively by a matrix and to get, you know, the same dimensionality. And again, for that one particular pixel, various output channels. In other words, what we get thus is effectively a deep network that takes, you know, input channels, CI, and generates output channels, output, and this is a very convenient way of adding more nonlinearity at a very low cost.
Now, the last thing that we need is pooling, and pooling aggregates channels, uh, well, sorry, pixels. You could also pool over channels, but nobody does that. Um, so convolutions, and it does two things. First of all, convolutions are really sensitive to position. So detecting vertical edges, for instance, if I just, you know, were to shift all the pixels by one, then my edge would move by one. But if I want to have some invariance to translation and other things and lighting, object positions, appearance and scales and so on, then I need to engineer a mechanism that affords some invariance. And one way of doing this is by picking a window and then returning the maximum value over that window. So for instance, in this case here, you know, the largest value on the upper left square is four, on the upper right is five, the lower left it's seven, and then there's eight, right? So this is fairly straightforward. And as a matter of fact, if you use max pooling, you can get a lot more meaningful features. So this is the other thing that was quite different from the deep networks of old, namely that you use max pooling rather than average pooling for changing the dimensionality. You can see that in this case on the below, and it's probably some bird or some creature like that, you get much more pronounced and meaningfully structured features extracted by max pooling rather than by just using average pooling. And of course, you can use that with strides and padding and all of that. So it's exactly the same idea as before. And in summary, what you thus get is a rather versatile set of tools to manipulate the expressiveness and dimensionality of images by adding channels, by removing channels, by padding them, by changing the strides and so on. And thus by moving, for instance, from a convolutional neural network to multi-layer perceptron at various speeds reasonably efficiently. Just to sum it up, I might have some input images, input channels like RGB, red, green, blue, times height times width. And then I have kernels, which are like output times input, times, you know, the, the corresponding channels, times, you know, the height and width of these kernels and have simple biases, I have corresponding outputs, and then thus the complexity, number of floating point operations, let's say I have 100 channels and I have a five by five kernel and a 64 by 64 pixel image, so that's kind of small, it still already adds up to one gigaflop. So let's say I have 10 layers and I have 1 million observations, then that costs me 10 petaflops. Okay, that's a lot. Now, what does it mean in particular is if I run this on a CPU, which runs at maybe 150 gigaflops, so that's a pretty good C CPU, then this will take me around 18 hours, whereas on a GPU, and this is a reasonably low end model by now, it's a quarter of an hour. So you can see that the speed up is very significant, right? It's basically almost two orders of magnitude speed up that you get by moving from a CPU to a GPU. And that's why basically by now everybody's writing code for accelerators like in CUDA in order to run deep learning algorithms efficiently. Okay. So this was a lot of technical material to get you up to speed on how convolutions work. There's a lot more to know about it. So there are five more chapters and have a look at them and walk through them in a bit more detail to give you an idea of how and why convolutions work.